NBC News. Around the world and into your home. This is 2020 Downtown. With Elizabeth Vargas, John Quinones, Cynthia McFadden, and Jay Shadler. Tonight, October 7th, 1999. These are the faces of madness, America's most infamous serial killers. And this is the student obsessed with enticing them. He played a dangerous game of words and phone calls, turning himself into their fantasy victim, feeding their depravity, not realizing the risk. If I knew then what I know now, I would never have done it. John Miller with a young man who danced with the devils, pen pals from hell. Act one, pen pals from hell. And now, John Miller. I'm about to introduce you to a young man who had a very dark and ultimately dangerous obsession. You see, Jason Moss was fascinated with serial killers. So to study them, he developed his own unique strategy. He assumed a series of identities carefully constructed to make him irresistible to some of the most dangerous predators in captivity. You see, the idea was to play their game one of seduction, manipulation, and ultimately control. But Jason's dangerous game got way out of control. Oh, and Jason Moss? He's not a trained FBI profiler or even a psychologist. No, Jason Moss was an 18-year-old college freshman. Jason Moss had played mind games with them all, the one who had his followers kill for him, and the Night Stalker who had no followers and didn't need any. He liked the killing too much to share. And the man with two faces who buried the boys under the porch. Jason's elaborate dance with the devil began innocently enough while he was still living at home with his parents in Las Vegas. One day, he was browsing in a bookstore looking through the true crime section when one book in particular caught his eye. It was called The Killer Clown. Now I'm really getting intrigued. The next page I turn, I find out his name was John Wayne Gacy, and he had raped and murdered 33 young men and boys that were just like me, my age, and, and who looked just like me. For years, John Wayne Gacy lived a double life. To the outside world, Gacy was married, a successful businessman, an upstanding citizen who used to dress up as a clown for neighborhood children. But in secret, he was a killer luring young men into his suburban home where he would have sex with them, torture, and murder them. Many were found buried in the crawl space underneath his house. Jason was intrigued by Gacy's story, so he wrote him a letter and got the idea to cast himself in the role of the ideal victim. I was very vague about my sexuality, but I told him I worked out at the gym, kind of to entice him. Gacy took the bait. A short letter arrived from death row asking Jason to tell him more about himself. So you had opened this channel, and now you were trying to reel him in. Now I was trying to make him see that Jason Moss was someone worth talking to versus all the other people I assumed that he was talking to. Jason was right. He had to set himself apart. John Wayne Gacy received hundreds of letters every week. And as sick as it may sound, Gacy's notoriety had turned him into a celebrity. Jason knew Gacy had a troubled relationship with his father, so in his next letter, he played on that. Dear Mr. Gacy, the constant screaming of my father keeps me secluded in my room when I'm not in school or at the gym. I hate it here at home, and I guess I understand what it's like to need a friend. Soon, letters from Gacy were arriving weekly. Gacy also sent Jason some of his original artwork. Gacy's paintings were selling for thousands of dollars in posh galleries. In fact, Jason's strategy worked so well with Gacy, he decided to try luring another serial killer, a man they dubbed the Night Stalker. By now, Jason was hooked. He was corresponding with six killers, taking on a different persona for each. They sent Moss letters, cards, drawings, but the most prolific pen pal of all was the murderer they called the Killer Clown. You know, people say, well, how do you feel about death? They just set an execution date on me. Soon, the letters weren't enough. Gacy began calling Jason Collect at home from jail, urging him to experiment with other men. Gacy offered his own views on sexuality. To me, when you're, when you're having sex with somebody, irregardless of who it is, the object is 
the sensation of getting each other off. Mm -hmm. It's not love. It's, it's just a physical desire. So Gacy thought that he was leading you towards these things, that he was the master puppeteer and you were his half-witted student. He would lead me, so to speak, and I would just follow his lead. He would tell me how, you know, men should pick me up or men will treat me, but really he was telling me about how he picked boys up and how he treated boys. To Jason, John Wayne Gacy was becoming like the fictional character Dr. Hannibal Lecter from Silence of the Lambs. It was all quid pro quo. In order to get Gacy to open up, Jason would have to reveal things about himself. So he fed Gacy made-up stories about hustling for tricks on the Las Vegas Strip. And in return, Gacy revealed a few tidbits of his own. I think that was one of your questions, if I had sex with another inmate. No. You never had? No. Why is that? If because I had sex with one of my visitors, yes. Jason's little game of cat and mouse was escalating. And I had to wonder, was it really dangerous? I put the question to some real experts. The Academy Group is made up of former federal agents who spent years profiling serial killers. He had enough knowledge and ability and intellect to get into it, had no idea what he'd experience in it, and then had no game plan for concluding it. I think it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, the spider and his web, uh, the spider being John Wayne Gacy, and the fly and the fly being uh, Jason Moss. But in Jason's mind, it was the other way around. He was convinced he could manipulate Gacy into revealing secrets about his crimes. So when John Wayne Gacy extended an invitation to visit him in prison, Jason jumped at the chance. Not surprisingly, Jason's mother was dead set against it. But then Gacy said he'd put the warden on the phone to reassure her there would be no danger. There will be cameras, two or three cameras on him. There will be guards there. Gacy would later tell Jason that the warden was actually a prison guard Gacy claimed to have paid off. But Jason Moss had no way of knowing that when he boarded the plane for Illinois and a rendezvous with one of the most notorious serial killers in captivity. When we come back, Jason's dangerous game takes a chilling turn. The power is in the hands of the predator, and so is Jason Moss. He made the decision in his mind, this is it. Now it's time, Jason needs to suffer like everyone else did. 